Hello, and welcome to this Machine Learning One course. My name is Dmitry Korbak. I am a, a researcher here in the University of Tübingen, working on machine learning and its applications to neuroscience. And um, this is actually the first time I'm recording a video lecture, so I think it will be a learning experience not only for you, but also for me. So I want to start with um, saying a few words about this course. As I said, this is introduction to machine learning course. It's supposed to be very basic. It, it Do not expect that after finishing this course, you're an expert of machine learning. Um, we will we will be making baby steps towards machine learning. And there are, so many of you are in the master's program here in Tübingen, and in the following semesters you will have uh, or choose to take other machine learning courses. So the purpose of this course here is largely to prepare you to be able to take any machine learning course that we offer um, and follow it, or prepare you to be able to open a textbook um, in, in, in the middle of it, you know, if you want to look something up and um, and uh, understand what's going on there. Um, the second point is that we will um, have around 10 lectures covering a broad range of topics. So we'll hop a bit around over the, over the you know, machine learning textbook, um, trying to sample and to give you an idea of, um, of how machine learning looks and, and what it really is. This is going to be a mathematical course. So this means that usually in the pre-corona times when I'm teaching this material, I'm using whiteboard. And when I was preparing these slides for this course now, I tried to also keep this, this whiteboard feeling. Let's see how it works. Um, but um, it's, it's, so it's focused on the math. Uh, we will have some practical assignments in Python throughout the course, three of them. Uh, but I'm not going to be talking in the lectures about any implementation or Python um, detail, so we'll have a separate time to talk about that. Um, all the necessary mathematics we will introduce as we go. So the experience tells me that some of you will not be familiar with some of the math that we need. I will not have separate lectures to, to, to introduce these mathematics, but we'll just jump right in and whenever we need something, um, I'll try to explain how it works. If you still feel that you don't follow, that that's too much, you want to, or you just prefer to read a bit more systematic mathematical exposition, then one book I can recommend is here in Mathematics for Machine Learning. It is freely available online, just Google it, you will find a website and it covers everything that we might need and more. Um, and finally, the my aim here in, in this course is to introduce key concepts and develop uh, key intuitions um, behind these concepts in machine learning. So the second thing that I want to say in the introduction is uh, what is machine learning? What's this course about, right? So let's 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 talk about that briefly. If you open Wikipedia and just read the the definition there in the first sentence, it says machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. That sounds good. Um, what I think this sentence brings in mind is something like, I don't know, a computer program playing chess or playing Go, something like that, or self-driving car, right? It, 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 it somehow experiences different chess games, for example, and learns and improves to play and then can beat human players. Um, so here's the, the, the um, one way to think about that as is to contrast it with more traditional approaches to solve this kind of problem. So traditionally, and by traditionally in this case, I mean, I don't know, 30 years ago, if you want to program um, a, a, a chess engine, or if you want to program a computer to, let's say, you present it with an image, and the algorithm should say if it's a cat or a dog, then in computer vision 30 years ago, you would try to come up with rules that would be able to solve this problem, right? So maybe a cat has whiskers and, and an ears like that, so you would try to build a pattern detector that will look for these ears, and if they're in the image, then it's a cat. So you put in some data and you put in some rules that you as a programmer come up with, um, and then the, the, the software gives you the answers. In the machine learning, it, it's a bit um, upside down, the same paradigm. You put in the data, and you put in the 
the, the goal or the answers, if you want. So you, you, you give a computer an image and say, that's a cat, and here's a dog, and then you repeat this one million times, and hopefully the afterwards, um, your, your algorithm will be able to discriminate a cat from a dog without you ever specifically uh, designing a rule that would be able to do that. And in some cases, maybe you don't even know how to distinguish a cat from a dog, or you, you can't formulate it easily in words, and the computer will just learn to do it. Um, okay, here is another definition from a textbook uh, that's called machine learning. The goal of machine learning is to develop methods that can automatically detect patterns in data and then to use the uncovered patterns to predict future data or other outcomes of interest. Um, that sounds a bit more general. And then Murphy, the author, continues to say machine learning is thus closely related to the fields of statistics, but differs slightly in terms of emphasis. So that's important, and I also want to discuss it briefly. Of course, if you think, what, what does statistic do? Well, it it detects patterns in the data and then tries to predict some outcomes of interest. Like the same definition would maybe apply to statistics, or almost the same. So what is this different in emphasis here between machine learning and statistics? And I should say that this is, of course, a topic where you can uh, find a lot of discussions um, with you know, some people saying statistics and machine learning is the same, or like they intersect and the part of statistics that is not machine learning is useless, or the part of machine learning that is not statistics is just engineering, and, and so on. So that's a very, very um, hotly debated topic. Let me offer my perspective here. So both statistics and machine learning aim to detect patterns in data, as in that quote, by building predictive models. The emphasis is slightly different here. So statistics will use this as a tool to learn something about the world. Um, in statistics, it's called statistical inference. We want to infer some properties of the world that, that reveal themselves through the noisy observations, through the data. The focus, therefore, is on simple models, on interpretable models, such that after you fit the model, you can actually look at that and learn something, right? And um, since the models are relatively simple, one can develop a lot of theoretical analysis, work out how the estimation procedures will work under some assumptions, what are the statistical guarantees, and so on. So if you're taking any statistics course in parallel with this, and I know some of you are, then, um, then you will see how this actually applies to what you're doing in that course. Machine learning uses the same approach, so we're building predictive models to detect patterns in the data, but uses this as a tool to actually make useful predictions in, in, in challenging situations, and not so much to learn anything about the world. Therefore, it focuses usually on complicated and competitive models, deep neural network or something like that, uses very large data set, you, as long as your, as your model works in practice, um, great, you achieved your goal. You usually do not try to learn anything about cats and dogs by training a neural network to classify that, but you just want your, your, your system uh, your, mm, to, to be actually useful um, when somebody does um, you know, a Google image search or stuff like that. Um, so to a large extent, we're giving up here on the statistical inference, but we're focusing more on the prediction. Um, here's a nice paper that I reference here. From 20 years ago, uh, statistical modeling, the two cultures, but it's very influential, like more philosophical paper about these two different approaches. So if you um, want, you can, uh, I think it's still, uh, even though 20 years passed and machine learning changed entirely over these 20 years, I think this conceptual distinction still holds. So this, of course, also means, at least in my opinion, that there is no hard boundary. It's more like a spectrum, and you can you can arrange different predictive models on a spectrum, where on one side there is like a clearly statistics, and on the other side there's a clearly machine learning. So just to give you an example, the clearly statistical tool would be a one sample t-test, where you have a bunch of numbers and you want to test if they are, let's say, positive, actually, if the average is above or below zero, using a hypothesis test. In a way, you are fitting a model. The model has one parameter, and that's the average, and then you want to infer whether this um, average is above or below zero. On the other side of the spectrum is GPT-3, the recent um, neural network, gigantic neural network trained on all the text available on the internet and that is famously able to generate very, very human uh, looking texts. Um, 
and it's very very hard to say how exactly it works on the on the mechanistic um, level so at this point we're definitely not trying to learn anything about the text but we're just trying to generate um, uh, human looking text so that's clearly machine learning and everything in between I would say or a lot of things in between belong to both b b both fields um, so this is a cartoon that then describes how the machine learning extreme will look like you just have an algorithm that's completely non-transparent you put some data you get some answers um, but you 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 are not doing any inference because this it's not a black box. You know how how the algorithm works. It's a neural network, for example, but it's so complicated that it doesn't give you any new knowledge about your data. Whereas statistics, that's what statistics is after. So a lot of things though are in between. And for example, one of the textbooks, the the, the most the most well known textbooks on machine learning is called the Elements of Statistical Learning. Right. So that's a term that even tries to combine statistics and machine learning in one term. Um, by the way, about the textbooks, so the elements of statistical learning is freely available online, the same the, uh, about this first book here, Machine Learning um, by Bishop. You can also find it online. Both are great textbooks. Murphy is also very good. You will find maybe that if that's your first time you're learning about machine learning, they may be a bit complicated, but as I said, hopefully by the end of the course, you'll be able to, to, to read them comfortably. Final introductory part is what are the types of machine learning problems? And um, you will see very often that people have these three big groups um, of, of, of machine learning problems. So let's introduce this terminology here. So first group is supervised learning problems. In the supervised learning, you you have some some data like for example photos of cats and dogs the same example they are labeled so there's a photo and it says it's a cat and there's another photo and it says it's a dog and 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 so on so the the task is to distinguish one class from another or maybe you have 100 different classes still it's supervised because it's supervised by the labels unsupervised learning Imagine the same data, but you don't have labels. You just have a bunch of images, and that's all. You don't you don't tell the algorithm where the cats and dogs are. And an example here would be, for example, that you want the program to figure out that there are two different kinds of animals or more, and essentially cluster your images by what animal it is. So that's that's unsupervised learning setting, and the reinforcement learning is the third group, um, where, for example, you want the so where the program is more like an agent it has to make decisions uh, in some sort of game environment or exploration environment for example play chess play go drive a car that's all reinforcement learning tasks um, so in this course we are not going to be talking about reinforcement learning which has a bit of a different sets of um, set of um, ideas behind it you'd need to take a separate course to, to learn about that we will be talking about the first two mostly about supervised learning and less so about unsupervised learning which is the same in any machine learning textbook that you will pick up and that is because supervised learning is easier as we will see um, throughout this course i want to finish with giving this one famous quote from uh, jan lacun a deep learning researcher from a few years ago um so let me not uh, let me show this cake picture here. Um, so he said most of human and animal learning is unsupervised learning. And then compares it with a cake and says that the bulk of the cake is unsupervised learning. And supervised learning is only the icing and the reinforcement learning is the cherry and the cake. Referring to how the actual animal intelligence works. That's contentious. I think some people might disagree. But the idea is that if you are if you are a baby and you learn something about the world, most input that you get doesn't have explicit labels. You and you learn a lot from this input. You just you just look at the world and you somehow learn to categorize it. Um, at least that's the idea that people have about how baby learns, and that's largely unsupervised. But that's a very difficult problem. And until very recently, there was much more progress in supervised learning than in unsupervised learning. So this will also be our focus here in this introductory course. Okay, so with this, we can jump in and we will start with linear regression. So that might sound a bit underwhelming for some of you because we're talking about machine learning and I'm starting with a technique that 
is 100 years old or more, probably. Uh, very classical statistical method, linear regression. However, I think that actually it's very useful to demonstrate a lot of concepts in machine learning. So we'll, in fact, spend like four lectures on linear regression because it will, I will just use it as a vehicle to introduce a lot of useful concepts that then appear everywhere in machine learning. And today, we're really talking about a very, very simple situation. Um, so simple linear regression is not is, is actually a technical term. It's, it's, it's not um, a linear regression that is simple. You know, it, it, it means that you only have one predictor. So you have some, um, let's choose some example. You want to predict um, a height of a person from, uh, let's say, the age of a person. So x, in this case, will be the age, and y will be the height, and if you collect the data, then you will see that they're positively correlated, the larger the age, the, um, the, the higher the person is. Let's say the data, that's how the data looks like. Um, and we want to build, we want to fit a linear uh, function here. So a linear function will have two parameters. One parameter um, is uh, called the intercept, that's beta zero here, that's where this line crosses the y. Um, axis and the second parameter is the slope. Um, we have, so that's just some terminology here, that's a supervised learning problem, of course, it's because we have the y. This is not a classification problem, so we don't want to classify two, two groups of objects here, one from another, it's called a regression problem because we're predicting a continuous variable y height. We have some training data, which is a set of pairs, xi, yi, where i goes from 1 to n, n is the sample size. And we want to fit this model, right? So we want to fit the linear function to the data. So this means we want to choose the beta zero and beta one, we want to find the values of these coefficients that somehow yield um, the line that um, describes our data well. So yes, as I said, our prediction, the, the value of uh, f of xy should be close to yi. So how how would we how would we do it? How is it even what is the way to mathematically formulate this problem, right? As opposed to just say it should be a good fit. So how can we formalize the notion of a good fit? That's a central um, object here in machine learning. Is the loss function? So we want to write some function that will describe how well our given model with given coefficients describes the data, and we want to tinker with the model until it fits well enough or uh, until it's the best possible fit. So the loss function also calls the cost function sometimes. Um, and let me just give it to you here directly, the, the loss function of linear regression. Um, so let's look at that. That's the sum of squared values and uh, it's the sum of all training examples, right, from 1 to n of the squared deviation between the actual value and um, so the actual value yi here, and the, our prediction f uh, from x y, and then we square, sum it up, and divide by n. So it's the average of these um, uh, square deviations, right? And our prediction is of course just beta zero plus beta one. So that's what we're getting over here. Um, this is called mean squared error, right? Mean squared error. Why? So good question here is why are we using mean squared error as a loss function for linear regression? And I'm actually not going to answer this now. I suggest that you though spend a few moments thinking what other possible loss functions one could have chosen alternatively. So it's not obvious that that's the best or the optimal in some sense uh, loss function. I could have used the third power and not the second power. I could have used the absolute value um, so the first power, but of course I want to penalize the positive errors and I also want to penalize the negative errors so I can just put the absolute value and sum that up. Or maybe the fourth power or maybe some other function of this difference. Or maybe it should not be the sum, but the product, you know, that you can come up with a lot of functions that will somehow be small if the fit is good and large when the fit is bad, which is what we want. So why are we using this particular function? There can be several answers. One of them that is just computationally very, very easy to work with. And then you will see some other answers appearing in, in, in later lectures. Um, 
for now, we'll just you know try it out with this loss function and see how it goes. Another term that you might um, hear when you when you read on that topic is that this is called ordinary least squares regression or estimation problem. You want to find f that minimize this um, in terms of this squared error, so it it will be least squares. Um, okay, and now we will do. Um, another step, and instead of simple linear regression, we will consider what I will call a baby linear regression, and that's now not a standard term, but my own term, which is, I forget about the intercept. Let's try to fit even simpler model than that, so ridiculously simple model, which just has one parameter, and that's a beta, um, and the loss function is the same, but now also just has one parameter, beta, and of course, if, if I plot it as a function of x, um, then then we, we want to fit a straight line through this point cloud, but the straight line has to go through the zero, zero point because the intercept is just constrained to be zero. So I'm not aware of any simpler setting than that. We should be able to, to, to learn anything about that before we start um, talking about more complicated problems. So let's, let's think, and this is really important, about the loss as a, so what is the, about the loss function? The loss function is a function of what? The first question. The loss function is the function of parameters, of beta. When you change the parameters, the loss changes. So in this case, if you look at the loss um, that I've written up there, you imagine opening the brackets, the squares, and then summing it all up, you will get a polynom of, of beta, which is a quadratic polynom, right? So you will have some terms with beta squared, then there are some terms with beta in front of it, and and some leftover terms with no beta. So the, com the, the coefficients will be complicated because it will be sums over all samples um, of xi and yi y, 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 um, and so on, but it's still just a quadratic function that you study in school. So if we draw a cartoon of that with beta on the y-axis and loss on the y-axis, so beta on the x and loss on the y-axis, then it's a parabola, which has a minimum, and that minimum is what we want to find, right? So the, in statistics, uh, people write beta hat um, to denote the estimate. Given the training data, you want to estimate the beta. Um, there's some true beta, perhaps, that we don't know, but given the training data, we can estimate the beta, and given this loss function, our estimate should be just the minimum of this of this loss, beta hat. The question is how to find it. You have your x's, you have your y's, how do you find beta? So that's what we want to talk about. Um, so there's several ways to approach that, and I will introduce a funny way to approach that, maybe. So for this problem, it might look funny. Because you know, if, if you have a parabola, you can find where the minimum is. Like it's a school math. But let's approach it with this with the notion that we will later have more complicated problems where maybe the, to solve to find the minimum is not so easy. And the standard tool to, or the, the simplest actually tool in this case would be gradient descent. So when we apply gradient descent to our uh, baby linear regression, we get baby gradient descent. Let's talk about that. Let, that. That's the same parabola as before. And imagine that you have initial guess about what the beta could be. And it's not very good guess. It's just somewhere. It doesn't matter. It may be random. So you start with some value of beta um, over here, right? And then what you're going to do is you will look at the derivative of your function as a guide for you in which direction you should change your beta. So if the derivative here is positive, as it is, then you should go to the left, right? You should, you should decrease your beta. Whereas if, the derivative, if you start over there and the derivative is negative, then you should go to the right. And then you make a step and then you reconsider. What is the derivative here? It's still positive? Well, you go more to the right. Still negative, sorry. You go more to the right. If you are end up over here at some point, then, okay, the derivative is positive, so I go to the left. If by chance you end up directly at the minimum, then the derivative here is zero, which means you don't move anywhere, which means you're done, you found your minimum. 
So let's um, then formalize that. I will talk about this second picture in a moment um, and write down this update rule. So I start with some beta and then I'm looking at the derivative. So over here, the derivative of the loss with respect to beta and if it is positive, then I need to decrease my beta. That's why there's a minus over here. And the eta is just some number that we choose in advance, and that's called the learning rate. Right? So, and that's it. That's the baby gradient descent. It's super easy. You can program it in basically three lines of code as a simple for loop, and it will give you the minimum of your function eventually. The conceptual question is, Will this always work? Is it always a good idea to do it like that? And that's um, my second image. Um, tells you that perhaps not. So you can have a function that looks like that on the right. And if you start here, then the gradient descent will bring you down here, which is good. That's the global minimum. But if you start in the bad spot, then you will descend over here to this local minimum. And you will never go up, right? Because the gradient descent will never want to go up and you will be stuck here in the bad local minimum. So a function like that is called non-convex, and it's tricky to optimize a non-convex function, at least to find the global minimum of, the non -convex of a non-convex function using gradient descent, and in fact using any other method too. So luckily, in baby linear regression, also in simple and in any linear regression, the function is convex. So it never has this problem because it's a quadratic function, at least so far it's a quadratic function, so it just has one local minimum, which is also the global minimum. Um, so great, we can use gradient descent to solve this problem very effectively. Um, the learning rate. So what is, I said it has to be chosen in advance. What, what, what does it do? Um, I mean, it's clear what it does, right? It just governs how big steps you do. But uh, what, should, what should you keep in mind anything uh, when you set it up? Yes. Um, Here's what can happen if your learning rate is too large. You start at the initial point down here, and then you see that you need to go left, and you go left, but the step that you're making is too large. And what can happen is that you jump on the other side. And then here, oh, now the derivative is, is, is uh, what is it, negative, so you need to go to the right, which is correct, but if you make the step too large, you end up here, and then here, and then there, and this will never stop and you will just diverge away from the minimum instead of converging towards the minimum. So if your learning rate is too large, then you can have a divergence problem. On the other hand, so you might think, well, I just choose a very, very small learning rate, which is often a good idea. However, if it's too small, then you will just be very slow converging, right? You will, you will make tiny steps, and it will take you a long, 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 long time to converge towards the minimum, which is also not optimal. Um, so, in fact, it's, uh, it can be, can be tricky to choose the good value of a learning rate for any given problem. In some, for some complicated problems later on, for neural networks, people just experiment often. What, what is the good value of the learning rate? What works better? And then if you see that your loss function starts to grow, then you know, okay, you probably should decrease your learning rate. Um, Okay, that's, let's say you chose a learning rate that works okay, and your loss function decreases as you do this for loop, right? So you, you, you decrease your beta, for example, um, a little bit based on the derivative, then you look at the derivative again, you decrease it a bit more, you look at the derivative, you decrease it a bit more, and so on. So you have iterations here on the x-axis and the loss on the y-axis, and it just goes down. If it goes down, it means everything works well. It's not diverging. The question is, though, where do you stop? So you never, or with this kind of method, the gradient descent, you will never arrive exactly to the minimum, perhaps by chance, uh, very unlikely, that you will get a point where the derivative is exactly zero. So um, you need, it will just keep decreasing, and you need to stop it at some point. So you need a stopping criterion, which can be different things. You can say if you're... If the loss decreases from one iteration to the next by just a tiny amount, maybe, I don't know, 1%, then, then it's good, then I'm stopping. That can be a stopping criterion. You can say if the derivative is smaller than some limit, then we're close to the minimum, to the flat point of this, 
of the loss um, curve, and we can stop. Or in some cases, you just say, whatever, I'm just doing 1,000 iterations, and then I'm done, which is also a stopping criteria, and you just do 1,000 iterations then. But if you program that, you need to, you need to set up some uh, rule about where your for loop will stop, or while loop. Um, okay, so now, if we want to apply this to our baby, grade, baby linear regression problem, we need to actually compute the derivative, right? So I was always writing derivative, derivative, but what is this derivative? So let's do it. Um, so you have a loss function, here it is again. Um, we need to compute the derivative. It's super easy, of course, right? You just differentiate the square, which gives you, like, so here I wrote it all down, so you get a two, it goes in the front, then you get the same bracket, and then within the bracket, so remember that it's a derivative with respect to beta, not x, beta. So you get this minus x sitting over here, and then we can rewrite this a little bit like that, and that's it. So that's, if you have all your xi values and the yi values, which remember is just the training data, you know, the data that you have, then, and, and the beta is the current value of your beta, then you can compute that sum, you get a number, that number is the gradient, and then you apply the update rule, and you update your beta. And that's all you need to program gradient descent in this simple situation. Of course, as I said already before, in this simple situation we can work out analytical solution. We don't actually need to do gradient descent. If you want to work out the analytical solution, you in fact still need the gradient, right? You still need the derivative, and then you're asking where is the value of beta such that this derivative is zero? Because in that case, that's the minimum here. So we just say at the minimum, this function is zero, and I will put a hat already here on the beta in this equation because this means that when it's zero, that's the estimate that we're after. So the beta can have a hat. Okay, and that's just a, a very simple equation that one can solve. And this is the solution to our um, baby linear regression, right? So if you actually want to solve it, you don't need to do gradient descent, you can do that. But if you do gradient descent, you will converge to the beta hat. Um, hopefully. Now, if this is all clear, then we can go back to our a little bit more advanced situation of simple linear regression where we had two coefficients. We also had the not only the slope, but also the intercept, the beta zero. And let's try to see how this identical machinery that we developed generalizes to this, to this situation. So now we have, if you have some data, you imagine that you vary uh, your lines and not only the slope varies, right, but also the intercept. So you can move lines up and down, you can move them left and right, you can change the slope. Um, you have two parameters to describe these lines. So you have a two-dimensional space over which you are optimizing. So if you want to draw a loss function now, it's, it becomes a 3D drawing, right? You have beta zero and beta one, and for every combination of beta zero and beta one, you have a value of your loss. So it's a loss surface. It's not anymore a loss curve, I guess, that we had before, but it's a loss surface, and we want the minimum of that. So how does one find a minimum of, the, of a surface like that in three dimensions? And the answer to that is that one still uses derivatives, but one needs to use partial derivatives. So let's, let me briefly explain what it is for those of you who don't, who've never encountered partial derivatives before. Imagine that, so we think about that in the same way as before. So we have the surface, a, uh, a cup in, in, in 3D. You're starting with some guess, and then you wanna go down towards the minimum. But you have two things to change. You can change beta zero and you can change beta one. So what happens here is that we say, well, let's just do one after another. It's very simple, really. We just fix beta one for a second. So let's imagine we fix beta one. This corresponds to taking a cut through this 3D figure. You just cut it um, along the line of the fixed beta one. And you get a plane where only beta zero can change and that's essentially the situation we had before, right? Beta zero can change. For each beta zero, you now have the value of, of, of your loss, and you want to go down, so you can compute the normal 
derivative in this cut plane. And that, by definition, is the partial derivative of um, our loss with respect to beta zero. And then you can do the same thing, I don't have an image for that, but you cut at 90 degrees along the beta one axis for fixed beta zero. And then again, you just obtain a one-dimensional function where you can compute the normal derivative, and that's the partial derivative of this two-dimensional function with respect to beta one. And then, so we compute both, and then we update beta zero and beta one with the same update rule, gradient descent uh, update rule, um, using these two partial derivatives. So we'll see how it works. Ah, right, so I'm, I'm saying gradient descent, gradient descent, but where's gradient? So far, there was no gradient. So we can think about these two equations written as uh, written, written um, down in the slide as in fact two components of one vector equation. So let's think about beta now not as a two separate parameters beta zero and beta one, but as a vector. It's a vector in two dimensions. It has two coordinates, beta zero and beta one. Um, so I want to write this update rule in a way that has the beta um, as a vector. Well. It's very simple, of course. I can take these two partial derivatives and combine them together in a vector in two dimensions. And that's, by definition, is the gradient. So the gradient is nothing more than a vector consisting of partial derivatives along each coordinate. If our function has only two um, variables, beta zero and beta one, then the gradient is, uh, is a two-dimensional vector. Right, so we can very conveniently write down this vector form, uh, which is now the full gradient descent equation that in principle can apply to any dimensionality, but in our case here, right here, it's, uh, it's living in two dimensions. Um, so how will it look like if you, if you start iterating this uh, gradient descent update rule? So here's another way to visualize this, the same, the same loss function that I previously uh, drew for you as, 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 as this kind of a surface, right, sitting in three dimensions, now I can look at it from the top. If I look from the top, then I'm making a plot that has beta zero and beta one um, coordinates, and I don't have the, the loss coordinate anymore, but I'm plotting it like on a map, on, a re on an actual map of the terrain where you have mountains, right, and then you have this concentric curves that tell you uh, what is the height there. So that's how you should think about this plot. It tells you where it's higher and where, um, where the value of L of the loss is, is larger or smaller. And here it's, so it's, it's convenient to think about it like that because one can conveniently visualize what's going on if you start the gradient descent iterations. You start somewhere and then for every point here or for, for a few points, I drew these vectors and the vectors are the values of the gradient and the directions of them. So if you start over here, then the gradient is always perpendicular, in fact, so I didn't prove that, but it's perpendicular to this, um, to this curve that of constant uh, height, uh, which I think is pretty intuitive if you think about that. And you make a step in the direction of the gradient. Then you make a little step um, and you look at the gradient again. And you, one can see, I think, hopefully, you will all be able to see that if you, when, wherever you start in this plane, if you're making small steps and you don't run into this divergence problem, then you actually will converge towards the, towards the minimum. If you make too large steps, you can also start hopping from one side to another of this valley, and uh, if your learning rate is too large, you might diverge. So the same, exactly the same things that we uh, said before apply also here in the two-dimensional situation. Um, well, in order to apply that, you need to compute the gradient exactly as we had before in the one-dimensional situation. So th this is our loss with beta zero and beta one. So let's compute the two partial derivatives. And that's in fact as simple as before, just slightly more confusing because you need to remember where the zero and one goes. But you just, when you compute the partial derivative with respect to beta zero, you just pretend that beta one is not a parameter, it's fixed. And, um, well, you get this formula, uh, the first formula there, right? So the two goes before the sum, uh, in front of the sum, and, um, and you're just left with, with that. 
the derivative with respect to beta 1 is slightly more complicated, right? Because the uh, beta 1 has xi in front of it, so xi gets outside of the bracket. So that's what you have. And that, again, is all you need in order to program uh, the gradient descent here. So you, think of, you can think about that as a vector with one coordinate um, giving by the first line, the second coordinate giving by the second line. You're updating your beta vector by this vector on each step. As an exercise, one can think how to derive now the analytical solution for beta zero hat and beta one hat. So you say, of course, how do you do it? You say, well, this equals to zero, and this should also equal to zero. So you have a system of two linear equations. Um, they are linear, right? There's no square term anymore. This is just a good old linear equation system that one can pretty easily open the brackets and solve and then you obtain some formula for beta zero hat and beta one hat that obtain the minimum of your um, of your loss. And this concludes the um, this concludes the first lecture. Thank you.